Love and Watches is a podcast for male and female watch lovers alike. Perpetual Girl and Ranch Racer are a watch-crazy wife and husband team, bringing you the latest in news, gossip, controversy, and anything else that matters in the world of watches. We hope you enjoy the show. Hey, fellow watch geeks. Welcome to the Love and Watches podcast. This is Ranch Racer. And this is Perpetual Girl. And we have made it to episode number seven. We're really excited about this episode. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, Before we kick it off, I have to apologize profusely for being late this week. We try to get them out every other Tuesday. I try to get them out every other Tuesday night. So you guys have one on every other Wednesday to listen to. And uh, this week just got, it just got a little, little bit nuts with life and my job and I, I'm in sales and we're in Q4 and it's just kind of one of those nutty times of the year and we've had workers pounding nails into our roof all week mm-hmm. so it wasn't conducive to actually recording a podcast that would be of any good quality. So really, really sorry for getting it out late but we are getting it out and uh, I promise the next one will be out on time. So uh, with that, let's talk a l- really quickly about our topic. So the topic for today, I've been writing a ton of notes and I'm really excited about it. You've been really on it. I haven't done anything. That's okay. You so. can just throw in color. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know a lot of the stuff that I wrote down. Um, but really the, the onus behind the topic for today, when we when Perpetual Girl and I really got into this hobby, this crazy hobby a few years ago, uh, you know, really got serious about it, we started, you know, I, I would read every blog out there, listen to every podcast, try to learn as much as I can. But, you know, when you're reading reviews on watches and you're reading tech articles and stuff, you, you're reading and hearing all these terms that you just have no clue what it is. And a lot of times, and we've been guilty of it too, is we fail to slow down and explain what we're talking about. So what we're going to try to do is help uh, shrink that learning curve for you guys. So especially for those of you that are, and we know there's some of you out there that are brand new to watch collecting, and we wanted to try to shrink that learning curve and help you out by kind of going through some basics about, you know, watch, if you're going to get into this hobby, some basics we think you should know. And it'll, it'll be review for a lot of people, but I think it's a nice refresher. And I have some friends who are getting into watch collecting, so... Yeah, it'll be fun. It's definitely going to be a review for some. Hopefully, we'll keep you guys entertained and you won't get too bored. Uh, for for others, this will be new stuff. So we'll talk about some basics, then some maybe more advanced topics, things that you might want to consider uh, learning or getting into as you as you dive deeper into the hobby. And then we're going to go through a bunch of terminology too, because there's just so much that you read and hear. Uh, especially when you're reading the blogs, all this, the terminology that they use, and it's sometimes really hard to understand what they're talking about. So that is the topic for today. Uh, so, but, but before we dive into that, uh, we wanted to, so what we wanted to do is ask you guys a big favor. If you're enjoying the show, if you're listening to the podcast, if you like what you're hearing, or if you don't like what you're hearing or you're indifferent, whatever, uh, give us a review on iTunes. Just let us know. Rate us just a few words to let us know what you think about the show. It really helps. Uh, it, it helps us drive viewership or listener, additional listener mm-hmm. audience, sorry, on iTunes. Uh, and it also gives us feedback in terms of what you guys want to hear. So mm. if we don't get feedback, we don't know if you guys are enjoying it. If you're not enjoying it, uh, this is, you know, we're not, this is not a business for us. We do it because we love it. We actually have a pretty significant financial investment into this in terms of the recording gear and, you know, just a lot of stuff that we've that we've uh, invested in to make sure we're doing this professionally and it sounds good. So please let us know. Uh, it, it's, it literally is the only way that we're going to know what you guys think. Uh, also, go check out the website. Uh, all the podcasts are posted on the website. You can actually listen to them there if you want to. I know most of you guys will listen on iTunes or some of the other uh, podcasting apps, but you can listen on the website and we do put all the notes there along with pictures, links, everything. So I know it can be kind of frustrating if we're talking about something and you want to see what it looks like. So 
go to the website, you'll see it there. So that's, I think that was about it in terms of that. Uh, do you have any shout outs this week? No, I, I'm good. You're good? Mm-hmm. Okay. I have one shout out before we get on to the main topic. Um, I want to give a huge shout out to Mr. Andrew Hughes. Uh, Andrew runs watchhunter.org and I think on Instagram he's watchhunterblog and it, it's actually a really cool website. You, you should go check out the website. Again, it's watchhunter.org and he reviews, he does review some watches. I think he's a big Victorinox guy, so he's got a bunch of Victorinox watch reviews, but he actually reviews podcasts. Mm -hmm. which I think is a useful service, right? Because there's starting to be a lot of podcasts out here. And so he actually does write-ups on the podcasts. Um, He also has something called the Vendor Report. So he'll kind of talk about uh, sites that you can buy watches from. So he reviews those. So really neat service. Uh, Andrew reviewed Love & Watches about a month ago, I guess. But just a a big shout-out to Andrew. We appreciate that. That was our first uh, kind of the review of the show. Mm-hmm. And I we think really it, enjoyed it. Yeah. And I think it helped, you know, helps get the word out. So uh big thank you to Andrew. I also just, I was going through his website and I just realized he's a, an amazing photographer. He does portrait photography and I to hit the guy up one of these days and maybe he can <laughs> help me with my watch photography. But uh, anyway, I just wanted to quickly get a, a big shout out to Andrew Hughes. So uh, with that, should we head into the wrist checks? Sure. I'm going to let you go first. Okay. Well, first of all, our secretary, the dog, is here, and she's sleeping, so we will try to not wake her up, but I'm wearing a vintage Seiko ladies' watch that I bought on eBay. I'd never seen anything like this, and I posted it on my feed already, but... I, it's a funky shape. It's, it's really, very 70s. It's really unique, and it's not super-duper small as far as vintage ladies' watches go, but it's got a really unique shape with a champagne dial. And it's funny because I originally thought the dial was, um, did I think it was white or silver? And when I got it, I thought, oh my gosh, it's a champagne dial. And I had thought originally that it was yellowed with time, but it's not. And it's got a green and red stripe, uh, vertical stripe down the middle. And I've had a really hard time dating this, but I was able to kind of, with Ranch Racer's help and the help of the internet, I think it's about 1955 or 1965, but I think it's 1955 because it has the 11A teeny tiny, teeny, teeny, tiny movement in it yeah, in the know. back, but they both, it uh, actually, well. And I that's actually, a manual wine, right? It's that's a not manual wine. There were two and I bought both of them because you can always use parts, spare watch. parts, parts, but uh, one of them has the original metal uh, rigid wire bracelet with the safety chain and the other one has a probably an aftermarket leather band but they're super super cool i really love them and um so about 60 bucks each yeah they're pretty funky looking and they're really neat it's very space race i almost think it's got to be 60s just looking at it and Again, we'll post pics on the website. Uh, it is a really funky looking watch, and it kind of fits more like a bracelet. It's very loose. Mm-hmm. Right? It kind of rotates the one, around your the hand. one with the leather on it doesn't. It's snug, so it has a totally different. Right. And it's a brown leather band, so it gives it a totally different look, more like a field watch or um, equestrian, mm-hmm. maybe. But really neat. I yeah, really love. Cool. I love it. I love it. It, it so, is very fun. Watch collecting. I'm more into vintage. Ranch racer, not so much, but I, I really dig the vintage stuff. Cause I can imagine someone bought this and loved it and the styles really, you can really tell what styles were back then. You've definitely had some winners that have gotten me though. I mean like the, the Seiko Belmatic that I did the video on yes. I and mean, that's a, that's a yeah. really cool, really cool vintage watch. Yeah, I found that one too. But yeah, in general, you <clears> tend <throat> to be more into the vintage. I tend to be more into the shiny new, I guess. But vintage is <clears throat> inspiring what's modern. So yeah, for sure. Cool. All right. Is it to me? Mm-hmm. Okay. So I'm wearing a watch that you actually gave me. You surprised me with, you came home mm-hmm. from shopping one day and said you had a gift. Uh, and it, it's the Seiko Presage. And I want to say it's the 
SRPB43. So it's got like this really cool, like sunray, silvery, light blue dial, uh, all polished indices, no no numbers, just indexes, and then uh, a couple of really nice sword hands and a date window. It came on a patent, a black patent leather strap. Very, very shiny. I love the dial, like but party shoes. <laughs> but yeah, it was it like tuck shoe. It was just too. It was just the 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 strap just made it too formal for like daily, you know, with my jeans and country shirts. It was just not. It just wasn't working. So it's been sitting in the in the watch box until I ordered a really cool quick release, uh, like a matte blue leather strap, and I posted that on Instagram today, and it totally transformed the watch. So now it is a a daily wear. I actually just got the the uh, strap in the mail today so i originally wanted to get you cocktail time the silver you can't i can't find those anymore. it's a limited edition so you have to find it through someone selling it but this is actually they have a three seiko cells three different colors that are like their production runs their regular what's the terminology see i'm still learning too i don't know but that is mimicked it's mimicking the cocktail time so it's got the silver bluish dial it's a gorgeous dial especially in the sun i mean it just pops in the sun and lots of sparkle uh fully polished case and lugs and it's a really pretty watch dressy though and especially with that gorgeous glossy leather band it was Mm -hmm. just too much but patent but now with this uh with this kind of more matte dark like a navy blue leather band it looks great Mm -hmm. so i'm pretty stoked about this one i'm going to be wearing it a lot more and uh, you guys will probably be seeing more shots of it on Instagram. So that's what I'm wearing today. All right, so we got through begging and pleading you guys to give us some reviews on iTunes. <laughs> uh, I groveled about being late with the podcast this week, and we got through a rest check. So I think we can successfully say we got through all the prelims and we can get to the the topic at hand. So... The way I kind of laid this out again is we want to go through kind of some basic knowledge on on watches and and watch collecting and then maybe some slightly more advanced a couple more advanced topics that you might want to consider getting into and then a bunch of terminology and I you know I apologize right from the get go because I'm sure I missed a ton of stuff in the terminology but it's going to take us a while to get through it so you know if you guys um let us know, you know, in the comments on Instagram when we post the uh, the podcast. If you think of other stuff that might help people, please just just speak up and put it right in the comments, and uh, and that'll uh, that'll help some folks that are really just getting into this this hobby. So, uh, so with that, let's let's talk about the basics. What do you think? Yeah. Sounds good. Okay, so the first thing that we really need to that we really need to talk about. And I think it's, I mean, this is, I think the most basic thing you need to understand if you're going to collect watches. And that is just understanding what powers your watch. How do those hands move around the dial? Uh, in I think it was maybe episode two, I don't know. One of the early first earliest podcasts that we did, uh, we got into a decent amount of depth on, quartz powered, you know, battery powered quartz watches versus mechanical and then manual wind and automatic know what's in your watch. I mean, I, you, I don't think you really can collect and be a hobbyist if you don't know what's powering the watch. So, um, and we like it all and we've got quartz, you know, battery powered watches. Mm-hmm. We've got mechanical hand winds. We've got mechanical automatics. We've we have got, modern hand wind. We have vintage mm-hmm. hand wind. We've got, I've got um, a transistorized watch, which is a whole new movement that I didn't even know about that, that I posted really a, a video of on the website. So if you guys are interested, go check that out. Um, kind of halfway between a quartz battery powered watch and a mechanical watch. So neat stuff. But obviously, if you're going to be collecting, you have to understand what's inside that watch. So there's plenty of reading you can do. Go out there and learn. You can listen to our podcast. We talk about it. Basically, if it has a battery, it's going to be a quartz watch. So, um, and then you've got newer watches like smart watches, right? Those are powered mm-hmm. by rechargeable batteries. So, all a little and bit different. And you've got Eco Drive Solars. Yep. There's there's solar powered. There's battery powered, or there's 
electric powered, but it's powered by a winding rotor similar to an automatic mechanical watch. But the rotor, it's the I think it's called Kinetic, uh, Seiko Kinetic, and so the rotor is what charges up your battery or your your capacitor. So, bottom line, you got to know what's powering your watch. That's that's the base. That's a basic basic thing. You got to understand that. Uh, next thing is know what you're paying for. Um, you know, we've talked about this in podcasts as well. If you're going to go out and spend, I don't know, thousands of dollars on a watch understand what's in it especially for you ladies out there because there is still a tendency for manufacturers to put a less expensive battery powered quartz movement in a watch and then add a bunch of bling diamonds that kind of Mm -hmm. stuff to it if that's what you're into more power to you but just understand that someone's going to ask you know at some point if someone sees that watch or you get a new conversation someone's going to ask so just understand you know, when you're handing over your hard earned money for a watch, whether it's a new watch or a vintage used watch, understand what you're paying for. I think that's really, really important. Um, you want to talk a little bit of definition of a fashion watch. Yeah. I fashion watches, I believe, you know, there's a lot of brands out there that make watches that are, I don't want to say trendy. They don't make them they, like Michael Kors and, uh, Basically, any of the watches that you find in a department store that are like name brand watches, right? right, That you would recognize that to me, that's fashion watch and they don't make them. They're made for them by the big groups like Fossil and some of the other groups. So those watches are, they're pretty, they're pretty up to date on fashion. Um, They're pretty, they're, um, they usually use colors that are more fashionable as far as current trends. Um, it's kind of, it's interesting to me because some fashion watches I think can stand the test of time. Others, maybe not, but that's kind of a whole niche of its own. It it is. And those are, you know, the, the term fashion watch kind of, it's, it's has a negative connotation in the world of collecting. You don't want it to be like a dirty Um, phrase. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's a dirty watch. Uh, (laughs) Uh, but I guess for me, a fashion watch is when a, like a clothing brand or a brand that makes everything bags or, you know, handbags or whatever, right. A, a brand that you're going to find well, in a be main though, department store. I, I, I know, yeah, but cause there's other brands that are big. Basically brands. those brands are just trying to get their name on other things that you would put on your body and look at. Right? Well, you it's, also see it with big French you know, I don't want to say names, but there are some big fashion houses. No, but that's different. That like watches. you're talking like Cartier, but Cartier has a huge history Jewelry, in watchmaking. Correct. I mean, and a and huge all history. They all of those guys have histories in watchmaking. And they make I'm, beautiful things. Yeah, but it, it, this is more like like you see a watch with polo on it, or you know, a Michael Kors is definitely a fashion watch, fashion brand. So those types of brands that you're going to see in a department store that have a, a fashion brand on it right mm-hmm. i mean that's basically what they and are there's so many of them out there because our jeweler said our local little tiny town jeweler said i've changed more batteries in michael kors rose gold watches than i could <laughs> shake a stick at yeah <laughs> but so, they're they're very fashionable and everyone loves them and i have one i have a lot of fashion watch. i, I don't have a lot I mean, of a lot of people watches, even but, consider fossil a, a fashion watch right. but the fossil was started as a watch company correct as an affordable watch company I but a, i have a late 80s fashion watch from fossil yeah but they've kind of fallen for whatever you know probably because of low cost and they've kind of fallen into that been put into that same fashion watch bucket i guess but anyway it's just important to understand what that term means what those types of watches are it's not that they're bad if you dig them Mm -hmm. they're not very expensive usually buy them and wear them i think it's awesome and they can be great gateway watches (laughs) to suck you into the hobby they're not always quartz either because I bought a, a Fossil Automatic. It's got a Chinese movement in it. But it's a beautiful watch. Well, Skeleton and again, dial. To, and to me, Fossil is kind of right on the edge there of being fashion brand versus just being an affordable watch brand. They started out as watches. Well, exactly. That's yeah. what I'm saying. So it's, But most of the ones that you're going to find in the department stores that have the big name brands on them, they're, they're going to be quartz powered. They're not going to be mechanical mm-hmm. movement. So. Well, and if they do do an automatic like Fossil, they always have an exhibition back and... I love mine. It is rose gold. So I only have two rose gold watches and one's a fossil and one is, Oh, actually they're both fossil. Yeah. I think they're both fossil. 
Okay. So, so that's, that's our little spiel on fashion watches. Uh, again, understanding what you're paying for. So, um, next is understand where you're buying from. So years ago, eBay was like a great place to go. And I'm not going to say that eBay is not a good place to go to buy watches. Um, right. Because I just bought my amazing Seiko we, we do, Space We Man buy watch. off of eBay. Um, but as eBay's grown, it has attracted more, let's just say dishonest people. Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful, right? You're not, you're buying this watch usually sight unseen unless they happen to be someone in your neighborhood where you can go look at the watch. Um, there are, unfortunately, there's just people out there that are going to try to screw you. Bottom line. So be careful. And if you're not experienced, either talk to someone who's experienced in buying watches off of eBay or off of any online website. Um, and if, if you can't do that and you're not comfortable, don't do it. Just skip right. it. Right. I had two instances in the last couple of weeks where I tried to buy some vintage Seiko's uh, Moon Phase watches. And I got outbid by a dollar each time. At the last minute. At the last minute. And then, oh, what a surprise. You, you a day later, I got an email saying, oh, it didn't work out for the winner. And mm -hmm. this watch is being relisted. So you have a chance to get it. So apparently they have either multiple logins that they log in and bid. They bid up these items or they have buddies doing it. It's called whatever. chilling and it still happens today. So it, you got to be really careful of that. Um read people's reviews, you know, don't, it's always important to go on, uh, to, to look at whoever the seller's, you know, account, check out the reviews people are giving them. Um, and even sometimes that doesn't help, but I think it's at least a good start. There's other online places. The forums I think are good places because in general, the forums are going to be populated with collectors mm -hmm. and enthusiasts. Watch fans. So we've bought some watches off of off of other forum members and had great luck with those. Um, every once in a while you hear a horror story, but in general you don't. We bought watches off of dealers that participate in the forums and had really good luck there as well. So the forums in general tend to be, I think a safer place to buy than eBay. Um, Amazon is fine as well. Those are usually new watches. You're not going to usually buy a used watch off of Amazon. So, but just, just understand where you're buying from look at where in the world it's coming from because you might end up buying a watch that is all is is cool but you think you're going to get it next week and it takes a month and a half mm -hmm. to get to you right so just just understand that and, and be definitely look at be your cautious. location yeah just be cautious there are and i don't have a lot of experience in this so i'm not going to name countries but there are some countries out there that are known for producing clones and fakes and that kind of stuff so do your research oh that's a good point because yeah. I found a super duper cool Seiko vintage Donald Duck. Uh, I think it was like a Seiko 5. Might have been. And it had a neat blue dial. And I'm like, oh, this is so cool. And I looked and I, oh, I'm like, that's interesting. There's a serial number photo. So I looked at, there were other listings for a very similar watch. One was Mickey Mouse and there were other Donalds. And I looked at all five and they all had the same serial number. Yeah, it was not a model number. It was listed it was as a serial, serial number. number. So. Yeah, you just got to be careful, you know, and and you can tell they're using stock photos. They're not using photos of the actual watch. So the same photo was used for every single one of these eight listings. Yeah, it, eBay's not what it was ten years ago. Um, it's it's still fun and a, a can be a great place to buy. You just have to be just buyer beware. Just be careful. Do your homework, and and understand that there are people out there that are not mm -hmm. super honest. So. If you have friends who buy on eBay, just send them a quick text and say, hey, what do you think of this? Is this legit? Yep. Yep. So I think that's that's our warning for, for buying online. Um, next up, something I think is a good basic skill to have if you are collecting watches and you have a lot of quartz watches, know how to change your battery. It's really not that complicated. Uh, you can buy all the tools online, relatively inexpensive. Some of them are kind of junk, but you know, it, it's, it's trial and error. Uh, but it's, it's not hard to remove a case back off of a watch. Some of them unscrew. Some of them have multiple small screws around the, the perimeter that hold them to the case. Some of them just pop off. They're just snap fitted to the mm -hmm. back of the case. And there's usually a, uh, an O-ring. Uh, that, that seals it mm -hmm. like a rubber o-ring that seals it to the back 
if it's if it's a pretty new watch, it's you know, and you're not taking it in the water, reuse the O-ring. You know, that's fine. If it is a watch that you take in the water, beware. It's always good to replace the O-ring. And then, you know, if you haven't had it pressure tested, water water tightness tested, then there's no guarantee. But if it's just a watch that you like to wear around, you know, know how to change the battery. It's really easy. The batteries are cheap. I mean, I think I bought a huge, like, bulk buy of batteries. Well, the from, variety pack. Yeah, I bought a big variety pack. And so, unfortunately, be aware that if your friends and family find out you do it, oh, forget it. <laughs> every time they come over, they're going to bring like three watches for you to change the darn battery in. So it does happen. And then like your family will be out there visiting with your wife and everyone will be like, where's the Oh, he's in the back changing watch batteries. So just be aware. If you learn how to do this stuff, other people that know you that like watches will be coming over all the time asking you to change watch batteries. So anyway, I think that's a good thing to, to know. Another kind of common thing that we do as watch collectors is we change straps and bracelets all the time constantly constantly it's so fun pg and i sometimes will change straps like a couple times a day Mm -hmm. i mean we are really sick but everyone does it it can freshen up a watch that you've had for a while you guys can probably all hear the dog walking around back here secretary's back hi lay down no lay down (laughs) you gotta lay down she may we're not taking you out hey Lay down. Good girl. We're not taking you out. You got to witness the dog discipline. Down. Down. (laughs) Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. Uh, Where was I? Oh, I was talking about (laughs) strap changing. Watch straps. Um, So these days you're running into things like quick change straps, which are really nice because there's no tool required. They're fantastic. Provided they're, they're, you know, good, stable, not broken. (laughs) Because if they break, they could fall right off your watch. So... A spring bar is always going to be more reliable than a quick release, I believe. Yes. So along those lines, spring bar, you probably have people listening going, what in the world is a spring bar? No, this is why we're doing this. Mm So um, if you look at a watch and we'll get more into the parts of the watch here as we we move on in the podcast, but, but whether it's a bracelet or like a leather strap, it's held on to the watch by what's called a spring bar. And this is just a little tiny rod that goes through the end of the strap from left to right and the ends are spring loaded so then it pops into little holes on the inside of the lugs on the watch case and to get those out you need some sort of a tool and usually it's called a spring bar tool Uh, you can pick them up for almost nothing on ebay but i guarantee you if you buy the cheap ones they will break Um, there are other better tools out there on some of the watchmaker websites uh, Esslinger.com is one site I go to a lot. Um, but, oh, and you, you know who else? Terry from Toxic Natos has a great uh, uh, spring bar tool mm-hmm. with screw-on ends. because the So along with the forked end, so the, the spring bar tool, you basically have this little metal spike with a little fork in the end or a little a V. Two, a two-tined V-shaped. Yeah, and so that just... You put that between the lug and the the strap, or if it's a bracelet, there's usually a hole where you can kind of get it in there in the back or a, a channel, and then you you retract the spring bar until it pops out. And of when course, I, it's going to go sailing the first few times you try to do it. Oh, man, that. we've lost so many spring bars. It's a learning experience. I have a whole gross of spring bars that I bought because we used to, they yes. used to just go flinging into the carpet. Buy kits of all different sizes. Yep. But They're not expensive. I mean, not having to go to a jeweler to change out a watch strap or a bracelet, it's liberating. It's great <laughs> as a watch collector because you can literally change the look of that watch every single day. Um, if you're like us, you're going to end up with a box full of straps, mm-hmm. right? And you'll just look at a watch and go, I'd like a new strap. And you just go digging through the box and usually you find something cool. Um, so get a good spring bar tool. Like I was saying on on the, the ones I get from Terry at Toxic Nados, they have each end has a screw cap on it and that's good because on the other end there's just a another tool which is basically just a pin and that's frequently used to change the size of your bracelet because a lot yes. of bracelets have have these pins that hold the links together and you have to hammer the pin out or like with a Seiko 5 you use the pin to disconnect the buckle from the strap so that you can get at your yep. lugs well, and a lot of times uh, on some watches these days, they have what's called drilled lugs, 
which means the hole goes all the way through the lug. So instead of having to try to cram a spring bar tool in between the lug and the strap, you just take the pointed end of the spring bar tool, push it through the outside of the lug, through the hole on the outside of the lug, and that compresses the spring bar and pops it off. So oh, the right, drilled right, lugs right. are always really nice. Yeah. I, I love watches that have drilled through lugs. That's where the buckle, where you... You, you mean but like you, it meets the buckle, right? Uh, no, I'm talking about where it actually goes into the lugs. The the hole is drilled all the way through to the outside of the lug, so oh, you can just push the spring okay. bar from the outside. Okay. And that makes it a lot easier for, for strap changes, for sure. So drilled lugs are always nice. Not all watches have them. A lot of the micro brands these days are, are including drilled lugs, which is nice. It just depends on the look you want. Yeah, if totally. If you want to see it on the outside, I yep. suppose. So it's... Yep. Six of one and half a dozen of another. Well, and along those same lines, uh, if you are wearing your watch on a bracelet, you know either the factory bracelet or a bracelet you've you've purchased, know how to adjust the the length of that bracelet so you don't have to go to the jeweler. If you know if you guys are sharing a watch, like mm-hmm. you and I share watches a lot, um, and every bracelet's different. Like I said, some of them have a pin that you hammer out, and then. Sometimes it's just a pin. Sometimes it's a pin with a collar in the center. Don't lose the little collar. Oh, yeah. Seiko my, is, is renowned for is those like darn that. little pin and collar connectors, and they're a pain. But if you do it enough times, you totally get used to it. So I can adjust those really fast. Higher-end watches, even some of the higher-end micro brands, but especially like Omega, Rolex, they have uh, screwed links. So you actually use a tiny little screwdriver, and you unscrew the bar that comes out between the links and adjust it that way. So just depends on the type of watch Seiko, even like the kind of the entry level Seiko's like this, your Seiko Mm five. It's a totally different. It's like a fork that holds them. And that requires a special tool. If you don't want to completely fudge up the bracelet. (laughs) So I actually bought the special tool. I don't know. It was like 20 or 30 bucks from Esslinger. Um, But anyway, it's a good, it's a good skill to have. If you're going to get into this hobby uh, because you, even for yourself, you may be resizing your bracelet, you know, in the summer, it's going to fit differently than the winter. So good skill to have tools. That's the next thing I have on here. I talked about a spring bar tool. If you're going to adjust a lot of Seiko bracelets buy the Seiko bracelet tool, it's like, it's a, they're basically pliers and one time is just a regular straight time. The other time is, it looks like a fork. And that's used to to push those weird little forked lugs out of there. Mm-hmm. Very strange. No idea where they came it's up like with that. It's the, like the, the links from the side look like folded metal, right? Yep. <clears throat> yep. The uh, older Pulsar vintage watches are like that as well. Yeah, I guess they are, huh? My, Some old, of them are. my old 1980s Pulsar. Yep. Rolex homage watch. I, I really, way, but it was looser. I hate. I really wish Seiko would stop using those darn <laughs> things because they're a pain in the butt. Well, that's how they keep but, that watch affordable for everybody. Uh, I guess it's a great watch. Not, not like the pin and sleeve are that expensive. I don't think. But anyway, that's just my opinion. I can't stand them. Uh, so along the lines of being able to use a spring bar tool to get your bracelet off of your watch. Uh, the term that we all love to use in the watch collecting community arm cheese uh it's Ugh. like sweat and lotion and all the stuff that's on your body that ends up getting into your bracelet and after a while it's just this nasty gunky mess and the best way to clean that know how to get your bracelet off the case you can just wipe down usually but know how to get the bracelet off the case and then go out and buy a inexpensive 20 or 30 dollar ultrasonic jewelry cleaner mm-hmm. you drop it in there a couple cycles and it's gorgeous that's, and that's what you did cleaners. on the Bellmatic, and it looked like a brand new watch. Yeah, and that's we'll talk about more I- intense cleaning, I guess, uh, in the more advanced topics. Um, but yeah, I, I think from a standpoint of the dreaded arm cheese, it's the bracelet that you want to focus on. So if you can get that sucker off of there um, and drop it in the cleaner, and we do it all the time because we wear our watches all the time, so it's nice to be able to clean your bracelet and get rid of that junk. So. I think that kind of covers it for the basics. Again, guys, I know and gals, there's basics and stuff that I'm missing. Please go on to iTunes. Let us know what you think. Go on to Instagram. You know, if you've got stuff to add, stuff we missed, let us know. Help ever, help the community out by by uh, being a voice and, and letting us know if we missed something or if, or if we got something totally wrong because that's absolutely uh, could be the case. Oh. I hear the secretary barking. I do. 
So uh, let's see, slightly more advanced topics. Things to know about microbrands. So first of all, what in the heck is a microbrand? As you get into this hobby, you're gonna hear that term a lot. It's used all the time. Uh, microbrand, let's see, how do I explain this? Well, so if you look at like the major watch manufacturers, whether it's like a Rolex or an Omega or uh, some of the smaller Swiss brands like a Frédéric Constant or a Tissot, and then you've got the Japanese like Seiko and Citizen and those guys. Those are the the brands that you think of when you think about a watch, right? And then you've got all the, the fashion brands that we talked about earlier. Micro brands are a phenomena that started, man, I don't know, 10, maybe 10, 12 years ago. Really, they're a result of our economy going global and the internet and being able to communicate instantly with people all over the world. Um, and Kickstarter. Well, Kickstarter came later, but really what, what kind of fueled this was uh, a few factories in Asia, China, Hong Kong, the, in the, that area of the world that started uh, really pumping out uh, the components for watches, keeping in mind that you may not know a lot of the bigger Swiss brands and Japanese brands buy have been buying their components from these manufacturers and these factories in China and, and Asia, East Asia for a long time. Uh, these factories started pumping out more components and selling them to basically anyone that wanted to start a watch brand. So today to start a watch brand, you don't have to have a big factory. You don't have to have a huge marketing department, logistics, all that stuff. You basically come up with a design and then you start networking and contacting these various factories uh, in Asia and they will make your cases for you. They will make your dials. You can pick off the shelf stuff, kind of common components, or you can have stuff custom designed. They will, if you want, they will case the watch and drop ship it right from there to your customers. So you may not even see the product that you're making. Uh, a lot of the micro brand though, some of the micro brands are casing their own watches. I know Patrick at Detroit watch company cases his own, which, and when I say casing a watch, sorry, here we go again. Mm -hmm. When you case a watch. This is all about Ranch Racer this episode, I think this part. Well, some of it is, but. You're good at it. When you case a watch, all that, basically that means you're taking the movement, which is the, the guts, the brains of the watch, and you're putting it in the case and, you know, testing it and sealing it and water, you know, checking it for water tightness and all that kind of stuff. So some of the micro brands do that. So that's, I mean, I could go on for a long time about micro brands and what they are, but in essence, that's what a micro brand is. Now you've got micro brands that have been around for a long time and are well established. And I'm not going to talk about any of those micro brands today. As you read the forums and you read the blogs and you read reviews on watches, you're going to learn about those wristwatch review. We do tons of reviews on micro brand watches. So uh, lots of different websites to go to for that information. What's important to know is that you've got a couple different types of micro brands. You've got micro brands that have been established for a while. They're trusted. They've been releasing product, good quality product. Then you've got what I like to call the fly by nighters. These guys are part of the, uh, the crowdfunding phenomena. So Kickstarter and Indiegogo, and there's probably a couple others. Kickstarter is the big one. You will see if you do a search for a wristwatch on Kickstarter, you get hundreds, hundreds of watches that come back. As you start to go through, you'll be like, hey, that one looks like the one I just looked at. And oh, that one looks identical too. That's, those are, a lot of those are the fly by nighters. They're like, they're not into watch, they're not watch people. They are looking to basically turn a quick buck, right? With the cheapest components that they can buy from these factories off the shelf. They don't even ever see the watch. It's kind of slapped together really quickly. They do their Kickstarter campaign. If they hit their pledge number, they have these watches shipped out and they move on and you never hear from them again. So that's something to be aware of because the micro, it's a great, great way to get into watches because you can get, especially some of the more established guys, man, you get some nice, nice watches from these guys that are getting to the level of the established, some of the established Swiss and Japanese brands in terms of quality and function and execution. They do a really nice job. 
So Microbrands, I highly encourage you to check out Microbrands. Hit me up, hit Perpetual Girl up. We can throw all kinds of good brands your way that, that we think you should look at. But Microbrand is a great way to get in because they're affordable and there's a ton of really good quality ones out there. So, <clears throat> excuse me, that's my kind of shtick on the basics of Microbrands. Now, in terms of what you're going to see in those in those watches that you get from the micro brands, a lot of them will use quartz movements uh, from a company called Miota, which I believe is owned by Citizen. Uh, they'll they'll use quartz movements from a Swiss company called Ronda. So you'll see a lot of those. Mm-hmm. Um, you will hear the term NH35 over and over and over again. That's a Seiko movement that Seiko sells to pretty much anyone that wants to build a watch. So you'll see a lot of watches with a Seiko NH35, which is basically just a Three hand watch with a day and a date, mm-hmm. and some of my most accurate watches are um, watches that have the NH thirty five in it, like my Snoopy, Crazy Snoopy, it, and it's a total and crap Donald shoot. Duck, total crap it shoot. Is. NH thirty five is a basic entry level movement. You know they could be off twenty seconds a day, or you get lucky like PG did with her Snoopy, and it's two seconds a day it's or less. less. Than I two mean seconds. it's crazy accurate, but the point is they're not there isn't a human regulating each of those. Like when you buy a higher end Swiss made watch, there's usually someone that actually regulates those. And today it's more automated. A lot of machines will do it, but like with the, with an age 35, they just go rolling off an assembly line. They're auto regulated by robots on that assembly line. I guess I've never seen it, but usually humans don't regulate those. So, it's kind of it's luck of the draw in terms of how accurate they are. But for the yeah, higher end watches, there's actually a person going through each and every timepiece by hand. I think there is. I'm not 100 percent sure. I, I've never I, been I, to Rolex, so I, I don't sure know. Hope there is. Rolex is known for automation. They be, make a lot of watches, so I don't know if it's a person or if they've they've designed a lot of their own machines. So they may have designed machines that regulate those things. Honestly, I don't know. So I don't want to say that a person regulates every single one of them. You like to think that they do, but shoot machines can be pretty accurate. And the Rolexes that we have, and we do have some Rolex watches are very, very accurate. So another, that's another topic, but bottom line, you're going to hear any 35 a lot. You're going to hear Miota 9015 a lot. That's a, a mechanical movement that, Miyota makes that a lot of the micro brands use. You're going to hear uh, ETA, ETA 2824. That is a very, very popular movement that's used in some of the higher end micro brand watches. It's a Swiss made movement. ETA is owned by the Swatch Group, uh, in case you were wondering. Uh, ETA 2892 is another one. And these are, these are automatic movements. These are, most of them are automatics. Um, Salida is another Swiss mm-hmm. brand. Those, the SW200, SW300, these are some of the movements, that, the specs that you're going to see when you're looking at a micro brand watch. And not just micro brands. I mean, a lot of the big Swiss brands will use Salida and ETA. Pretty, I mean, all the Swatch, the Swatch Group brands for the most part use ETA. So, uh, bottom line, I'm just trying to kind of throw out some terms that you're going to see when you're shopping for micro brands. And you might be wondering, is that a good movement or not? But any of the ones that I've mentioned, if you see any of those, those are good movements. Don't don't stress about it. You know you're getting a good movement. So uh, I talked a little bit about off-the-shelf parts versus custom-made. So a lot of people will be like, okay, this micro brand is 200 and this one is 1200 Why is this so much, so much more expensive? It uses the same movement even. How could they be so different? Well, like I said, these factories in Asia will have basically a catalog and you can go through and you can pick your case size and you can pick your dial type and you can pick your hands and they're all, they're tooled and ready to, to build those. They build them all the time in the millions. Um, but a lot of micro brands like uh, Michael Seals, who's local, who I hope we're going to have Michael on the show one of these days, Seals watch company, Michael, uh, customs designs all of his watches. So the tooling that the manuf- that his manufacturers use is all custom tooling. So, you know, if you see a watch, one watch at a certain price with a with a certain movement, and another pro- another watch at a much different price with the same movement, the movement's not the only thing that sets the price. Um, if if it's a custom fully custom designed watch, it's gonna be more. You're paying for something that's different that doesn't look like a bunch of other micro brand watches. So that's something to keep in mind. 
but that that does make a huge huge difference in the price of a micro brand so i think that's is there anything else uh oh so something else just on the the kind of more advanced topics regulating your watch and this is something that i've just started doing uh there's a few different ways to do it but generally when you regulating a watch means uh making it in the most basic terms making it as accurate as you can possibly make it right and in all the different positions it's going to be held in when it is riding on your wrist during the day so they make special machines called time graphers which basically you put the watch on the time grapher the time grapher has a little microphone and it listens to the pallet fork clicking back and forth on the escape wheel and listening to those ticks and if you put a watch to your ear a mechanical watch you're going to hear those same ticks that's the pallet fork it's called a pallet fork and it's ticking back and forth and releasing and stopping the escape wheel and that's what regulates the watch and i think we're going to put a diagram on our website of all the basic parts of the watch uh yeah i'm going to link to a ton of stuff that we're talking about it i'm going to get the podcast out and i may not have all of the links done because i really want to get this podcast out for you guys but if you check back next week on the website i should have a lot more links up and information that you can follow to learn about this stuff uh but it, in any case the time graphing machine listens to those ticks and tells you how accurate the watch is right is it is it running five seconds a day fast is it running 20 seconds a day slow whatever and then if you are confident you can actually unscrew the back of the the case back on the watch and there's a little lever that you move back and forth usually you'll see a plus and a minus and you can speed up the balance wheel and you can slow down the balance wheel and that's how you regulate a mechanical watch so again that's something i'm just kind of getting into i've actually torn down and rebuilt some movements already but the you know it took me a while to to afford a time grapher and they they range from 100 bucks to several thousand so just depends on what you want to spend so I think that's that's most of the ad, kind of more advanced stuff that I wanted to cover. Very advanced stuff. So as you really get into this and if you get really passionate about it like me and like PG lately who's been talking about this, you can learn how to service a watch, a mechanical mm -hmm. watch. Now what that means is you take the entire watch apart, you take the movement out of the case, you take every little gear and screw and every every little part that makes up that movement all those things come out they go into a drawer or they go into these little cups you got to wash it all clean it and then you reassemble and you use the correct lube the correct oil and the correct grease to put it all back together so that's if you're just really crazy and you want to super get into this and i do i i mm -hmm. dig it and we have a lot of mechanicals and if i have to pay to have all these things serviced I, i'll be broke I won't be able to afford it. So I got to learn how to do it myself. <clears throat> Lots of good online resources. I'm going to include those as well. Okay. Terminology. This is where I know we're going to miss a ton of stuff. Well, we need to look at our time. Cause no, we're, we're good on time. Are we? Oh. Yeah, I knew that we knew this was going to go longer. Okay. So we're already, looks like we're at 50 minutes. So uh, we'll get through some of this terminology, but this is kind of the stuff that really frustrated me when I was first getting into it because I didn't understand what they were saying when I read a watch review and they were talking about perlage or they were talking about guilloche or they talking about end links. Rehot. Rehot. I'm like, what in the world is this stuff? So I've got a list of stuff. I wrote down PG. You may think of some stuff as we go through, but if you start the most basic when you're reading a review on a watch, they're going to go through some specs. I'll talk about the case. Well, it's pretty obvious. The case is the main portion of the watch. So it's what holds the dial. It's what holds the movement. Everything attached to that case, your bracelet, strap, all that stuff. It's usually made up of a center section, a case back. And I talked about how those case backs can get attached. And then... And they can be exhibition backs or solid backs. Yep. Yeah, you can actually... Some of them have a see-through window where you can actually... Oh. Oh, time for dog pills. <laughs> that's your watch, or that's your Is phone, mine? not mine. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Time for dog pills. Everyone got that? Time for dog pills. So, anyway, so you've got the case back. It could be see-through, so you can, if it's a really nice movement. I mean, a lot of the micro brands will put 
see-through case backs on just because they know people get a kick out of seeing the movement even though it's not highly decorated. So you have your case and then you talk about things like case size. If you read a review and it says case size 38 millimeter, it's talking about the diameter of the case. Okay. doesn't usually include the crown that sticks out and that's what you use to yes. set and wind the watch. But when you talk, when we're talking about case size, usually we're talking about the diameter of the case. Um, the other portion that gets left out a lot though is thickness. And a lot of times you'll read a review and you go to the specs and they don't say anything about case thickness. And it makes a huge difference in how a watch wears on your wrist. Mm -hmm. So for me, the sweet spot for love and watches sizes is like 38 to 42. Cause those are watches that PG and I can both wear. Uh, but they get smaller, they get huge. And 42 is actually on the little large side for me. It is. Yeah. And 40 is kind of your max, I think. Yeah. 40 is about it. Yeah. If it's a low height watch, 40 is okay. Yep. Yep. So that's, but just keep in mind, if, if it says case size, it's talking, they're, they're talking about the diameter of the watch. That's the most referenced size when you're talking about a, a watch. Uh, lugs. You're going to hear the term lugs. The lugs are what hold the bracelet or the strap to the case. Sometimes they're integrated. Actually, usually they're integrated kind of as part of the case. Um, older styles, they're, they're called wire lugs or welded lugs. And that's it just looks like a wire that's been welded on. They used to do that with old pocket watches. They'd weld a wire on so mm -hmm. you could actually strap, strap the pocket watch to your, to your wrist. But the lugs are what hold the strap or bracelet to your wrist. You know, in most basic, you'll hear lug width or you'll read about lug width. That is, that's, it's just the width between the inside faces of those lugs. And that's how you buy straps. So if I've got a 20 millimeter lug width, that's how wide that strap or bracelet is. So when I'm shopping for an aftermarket strap or bracelet, it needs to be that width. So that's what lug width means. You'll usually see them like, Typical is 18 millimeter, 20, 22, kind of the even numbers. Mm -hmm. 18 to 22 is about it. Yes. Every once in a while, you'll see one with a 19 or a 21 or a 23. They go up to 24. Those are odd sizes. They're harder to find, you know, aftermarket straps. So keep that in mind if you're looking to watch that is really cool. And then you look at the lug within is 19. Just remember, it's going to be a lot harder to find straps right. for that. So if you're in love with the bracelet that's on it, then, then you're cool. you don't have a problem. Yeah, it just means that that bracelet's going to live on there forever if you can't find a, a replacement. But you know, so. back in the day, I had one watch and I wore it every single day. I showered in it. And you didn't when change I was a young the strap. Person, I never changed the bracelet. Yep. yep. So it just, but it's this all This podcast you is do. about helping watch addiction, right? And we need to know how <laughs> to change our straps. So Collectors. I don't like watches with 19 millimeter straps. So I try to avoid those. Uh, and then speaking of bracelets or straps, we've, we've talked about, you know, a metal bracelet. That's exactly what it is. It's a metal bracelet. It can have, if you hear a term called like a three link or a five link, that just means if you're looking at the bracelet from edge to edge, it'll have three links and they're usually offset. So the two edge links will be at this on the same plane and then you'll have a center link and that connects to the next link in the chain. So that's, that's all that means. And first and foremost, when you say bracelet, that basically means the metal. Yes. The metal bracelet, the metal band that come, as opposed to strand yeah. or NATO Yep. or, and we'll get into all that later. No, we're going to get into it right now. Oh, so okay. if you talk about, so bracelet is pretty self-explanatory, but then you've got, uh, and they're, they're either going to be stainless steel or if it's a gold watch, it could be white gold or yellow gold or rose gold or platinum or whatever the metal is that they happen to be using. And then you've got leather straps and you've got, you know, um, like the patent leather that I caught on, on this Seiko. You've got cow, you know, more like, uh, like saddle leather mm -hmm. straps. All you've different got materials, linen, cotton, canvas. All kinds of different materials that they'll use. And really cool, like the canvas. I love the canvas strap on my... My Vostok, it's really cool. Um, I'd love for somebody <clears throat> to do like a seagrass or hay sort of braided seagrass, like a tatami mat. We got plenty of hay mat. on this property. Go figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see some sort of tatami mat pattern. Yeah, hay laying everywhere. Which is kind of like a purlon. Purlon is a nato that's like woven with multi strands. What's and a nato? Why don't you talk about nato? You're <laughs> a big nato guy. I'm not I a big, big nato, nato person, but... 
Uh, and you I'm not going to talk about the history of where these names came from. They all they came from military, obviously. If you hear NATO or RAF, which is Royal Air Force, or Zulus for Zulu time, this is all like military terms. Um, if you think about how, like, a, let's take a leather strap, for example. You have the longer tail that connects to the bottom of the, the bottom lugs, and then you have this shorter upper piece that has the buckle on it, and that connects to the upper lugs. Well, those are held on by spring bars. So take the leather strap off, put the spring bars back in to the watch. So you can actually just see the spring bar going between the two lugs. Mm -hmm. A NATO is basically a nylon strap that kind of weaves through those spring bars. So it weaves through the top, goes around the case back, and then weaves back through the bottom spring bar. And that's how the watch is held to your, to your wrist. And there's, there's kind of your standard NATO, which is, it's a double pass, so you basically end up with a couple of different pieces of nylon mm -hmm. behind the case. There's single pass NATOs. Um, there are RAF, Royal Air Force designation, which is basically if you look at a NATO, you've got um, the keepers, which as you when you when you put the watch on, you've got the tail hanging out. You've got the keepers that kind of hold mm -hmm. the tail to the to the band, right? And then you tuck the extra tail. If you have a lot of extra tail sticking out, then you tuck it back into the for, little keeper. Uh, a NATO, you do, yeah. yeah. So you've for got all like, of them. You have to for well, if you're yeah. if you have small wrist. Correct, and, and you've got usually metal keepers on there. Well, a raft just has a nylon, one single thick nylon mm -hmm. keeper. That's Wrapped. it. And then you would just tuck the which I like because it gives it a nice in. finished look. A lot I of think. people love the rafts, yeah. and they're usually more affordable, right? Because you don't mm -hmm. have any metal keepers to to make a, to drive the cost up. So. Then you've got two-piece NATOs, which is basically just a nylon strap with a separate tail and a separate buckle end, same as a leather. Mm -hmm. right? They don't weave through the. Is there such the a thing bars. as a quick release two-piece NATO? Uh, yeah, two-piece nylon. Yeah, sure. You, two-piece nylon. Get, yeah, absolutely. Quick release. Yep, yep. You can get. So when we say quick release, that means that the spring bar is integrated into the actual strap. And there's a little piece of a little tab that sticks out underneath the strap. Like a button. And that's what you use to retract the spring end of that spring bar. So you don't need a special tool. You just retract it and it pops right in. So it makes it a lot easier to change straps. I love them. We're seeing them more and more. Uh, those are those are good. So anyway, just there's all kinds of materials that they use for these, these different types of NATOs. And PG mentioned Perlon. If you look at a regular NATO, you've got... Like a, a normal leather or NATO watch strap, you'll have holes, different holes spaced, you know, mm -hmm. equidistant. Punched. punched They're punched right. into the bracelet. And that's how you, when you, when you put it on your wrist, you select the, the one that fits your wrist. Perlon is just a tight weave and you can literally put the, the pin buckle, the pin through anywhere mm -hmm. through that bracelet. So I'm it's a big more fan of that because you can actually get the best size for your watch to, uh, you know, you can get in between you know, like where there would be holes, you could get in between. Yep. Yeah. So the Perlons are cool. I, I, I like it. And it, it gives too. it a more, it gives it a little bit more of a vintage or tropical look, I think. Totally. Yep. It's yep. a very different look. So it just depends on what you like. Clasps. You're going to hear some different terms when you're reading about clasps. Uh, one of them that we it took me forever to figure out was deployant. Sometimes you'll see it called deployant sometimes deployment um i believe deployant is actually the correct term it came from a french term but at the end of the day if you look at a metal bracelet and it's got a big clip that clips down and then sometimes it'll have another second one that it's called a safety clasp that cl clicks down over the main clasp that's basically a deployant um, if you look at like a typical leather watch band where you put the tail through the little keeper and then you put the pin through it, that's called a pin buckle or pin and buckle uh, clasp. And then there's others like butterfly clasp. Well, and there's double deployant. Yeah, there's where there's, they fold in from both sides, and there's one you press the the buttons on each side, and mm -hmm. both sides pop open. And then there's a pressure pressure release. All kinds deployant. of different ways to like release. Omega these things. uses you press the buttons and then one side pops open then you have to slip your finger in yep. and pop open the top part on their speedmasters the biggest thing to understand is deployment versus pin and buckle i think because where it really comes into play is if you're getting a watch or buying a third-party band um, you can actually get a leather 
strap and a lot of the higher end watches that you'll buy will come with a leather strap with a deployant on it so you mm-hmm. don't do the typical pin buckle it actually clicks down just like a metal bracelet what would mm-hmm. sometimes the tail goes underneath and is totally hidden sometimes it's still outside and goes through a couple of keepers yeah but so you're saying cool. you could basically retrofit any watch band you have with a deployant some you can not all but yeah there are deployant class that you can retrofit a regular pin buckle with so yeah it, it's it's an option some people love them some people don't you know a lot of people prefer the more traditional pin buckle, sometimes but. they're hard to fasten if you have any kind of dexterity issues like i have they can be a, I challenge. Have a really hard time with that yeah but um if you want to share yep uh sometimes a pin buckle the basic pin buckle is the the way to go if you want to share with that's your, the easiest way to share a watch between with, two people with your love yep. you know yep for sure or a NATO. A NATO is easy because it can slide mm-hmm. back and forth. So NATOs and pin buckle. Yeah, they usually have pin buckles anyway. So. NATOs are tough for girls, though. It depends. They can be for smaller wrists. Because you really you have know? to wrap the tail around a And lot. sometimes you, they don't have enough holes, so you got to mm-hmm. punch your own holes. So, yeah, it can be kind of a pain. But anyway, I think that's enough about straps. I think we kind of killed that. One, the, the last thing I want to mention, though, is the end link. You'll you'll hear about solid end links. Um the end link, all that is, it's the last link in a bracelet that connects to the case between the lugs. And why it's important is it's usually custom because it's shaped to fit those lugs. Because all lugs are different. They, you know, they not only are they closer or farther apart in terms of the lug to lug, the, the lug measurement, but some curve really heavily down across your the side of your wrist. Others go straight out. So the end link is meant to fit and look look nice in there so there's no air gap basically so it fits between the case and the bracelet yeah and and so the the end link in kind of more entry level watches will usually be a little hollow piece that goes on uh whereas if you're talking about some of the nicer micro brands or especially the higher end swiss or japanese watches uh, they're going to have a solid end link so it's that's it's literally just a solid link it's not hollow the spring bar goes goes through a, a little tube there, and then it connects to the watch. So you'll you'll see that. And if someone's saying solid end link, they're just saying, "Hey, this is a nicer bracelet. It doesn't have kind of cheap hollow end links. It's got solid end links." Okay, I think we killed the bracelet and the strap <laughs> terminology. We I'm getting beat it hungry. To death. I'm I am getting too. hungry. So crystal, you'll hear crystal a lot. The crystal, all that is, it's the clear. Uh, uh, window that protects the dial. Uh, traditionally in vintage watches, they used acrylic, right? So even like the, you can still buy a brand new Omega Speedmaster with the acrylic crystal because that a lot of guys like that classic. It gives it a little bit of a, a warmer. Some mm-hmm. some people authentic. think it gives it warmer, it's authentic, authentic yeah. more vintage. Most newer watches will come with either um, a mineral crystal, which is just kind of a basic mineral. Or a sapphire, a synthetic sapphire crystal. Sapphire tends to be harder, so it doesn't scratch as easily as a mineral crystal, but it will. It can shatter if you really bang it hard. It'll shatter. So uh, you'll see like Seiko has their own proprietary name for their mineral crystal. It's called Hardlex. So if you see a Seiko watch with Hardlex, it's not sapphire. It is a, hard, a, a custom hardened, less expensive mineral crystal, basically. So that's crystals. Not, not, nothing too crazy there. Uh, the dial is pretty self-evident. It's, it's the, it's the piece of the watch that it's the face, right? It's got all the numbers on it or the indexes and that's how you tell the time. But beyond the dial, there are some things you'll hear that you may not be familiar with like chapter ring. So if you look at a dial around the very outer edge, you'll see a bunch of minute marks, right? That's usually what we refer to as the chapter ring. Uh, sometimes mistaken for or interchanged with something called the rehot. And it took me a while to figure out what that was. But basically, if you look at a dial, it sits below the top of the case. And then on some watches, like if you look at, at, uh, I don't know, like a Rolex, right? The Rolex basically has these, it's just a straight, it's basically just the case Mm -hmm. side, right? And it just connects the dial up to the upper case. And that can be referred to as the rehot. Sometimes it's angled at 45 degrees. Right? And that's what connects the upper case, upper edge of the case to the dial. Sometimes it spins and that's called an inner rotating bezel, but it could also be referred to as a rehot. So it's basically just the piece that connects the dial up to the upper case. 
Uh, let's see. Movement. We've already talked about that. That is the brain. So the case is like the skull. The movement is the brain. That's what powers the watch. It's what, you know, that's what tells the time, whether it's mechanical or quartz or whatever. That is the movement. Um, sometimes you'll hear the term caliber. Now, caliber is basically just a fancy name for the part number of the movement. That's all it is. It is literally a part number. So you'll hear NH35 caliber, right? Part number, interchangeable. That's all it is. It's a part number for a movement. You'll hear reference. Reference is just a part number for the watch. So you look at Omega. They've got these crazy long reference numbers. You look at a Rolex. It's got six numbers, I think, today. Five or six. I don't know. Uh, that's they're just part numbers so you may it'll be referred to as reference it sounds fancy it sounds i don't know hot horology whatever it's <laughs> literally just a part number for that watch oh what else do we got here i know you guys are probably getting tired of hearing all this but i'm hoping it's helping for those of you that that have not heard these terms before uh on the movement you have something called the rotor so if you look at the back of a of a watch and it's got a clear case back or if you take the case back off and it's an automatic mechanical you'll see basically kind of this like half moon shaped doohickey that's connected in the center mm -hmm. that spins around the watch the thingamajig yeah there's other ones there's other types of rotors but long story short the rotor is what spins moves around bi-directionally sometimes sometimes only in one direction when your wrist moves and that's what winds the mainspring of the watch so that's what a rotor is Micro brands will frequently decorate the rotor on their out of the box NH35 Seiko movement. So, you know, that kind of sets them apart because they've got a specially, a special decorated But also, rotor. very fancy brands and very well known brands will decorate their rotors. They decorate everything on there. Well, yeah, and a lot of those are handmade. They're, they're movements made by the brands. Those are called in house movements versus off the shelf movements like an NH35 where you buy the movement and then you decorate the rotors yourself or you have them. You know, you have the manufacturer put those those decorations on that rotor for you. But that's what the rotor is. Uh, these are terms, the next few terms, I had no clue what these were when I was first getting into this. You'll hear the term guilloche. Uh, G-U-I-L-L-O-C-H-E. So, uh, looks like galoche, basically. But guilloche is for lack of a better term, is decoration. And there's different types of guilloche. So you'll hear uh, about circular graining, which is, or snailing, which is a spiral pattern that kind of starts small in the center and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So a lot of times on subdials, on chronographs, you'll see circular graining or snailing patterns. Uh, you'll see you'll see the term perlage. Perlage, perlage which in the automotive world is called what is it called? Machine turning, I think. But basically, it's oh, just... like on hot rods? Like yeah, like on the dash, right? On... It's basically just tiny little overlapping circles, right? And, and that's that's perlage. You'll hear hobnail, which looks like tiny little mini pyramids all standing next to each other. That's a hobnail. And how about Geneva, Geneva Stripe? Perfect example that's I didn't have favorite. on my notes. Geneva Stripe. Um, a lot of times, you'll see that on a rotor or the main plates of a movement. And they're just kind of these thick stripes that have been machined into the into the metal you see and they that look on great. watch dials as well sometimes my my citizen but... eco drive that you bought me for fun just on a whim that's got some kind of, of yeah they're kind of genius it, stripes the solar yep it has the solar panels that has that striping yeah and that's a great looking watch i love it i got really a lot of cool. com compliments on it yep so that's that's guilloche so if you start to see those terms that's what they mean and i'll, I'll try to include some links uh, that explains it a little bit better. I talked about spring bar already. Um, so kind of the last one that I wanted to talk about, and this is important that you understand this from a movement perspective, uh, is frequency. So the way a mechanical movement works, you've got the mainspring and it's wound up and storing all this energy and it's turning all this whole gear train, right? That runs through the watch. And you could, if you laid it out straight, there's a bunch of different gears and that mainspring is powering those gears. At the end of that chain of gears, you have something called an escapement. Now, if you didn't have the escapement, as soon as you wound that watch up and let go of the crown, it would just mm. zing, it would right? It would boing. just zing back. That, that spring would unwind really fast. Yeah, something so, has to hold it. Something has to keep, something has to regulate the power release from that spring. So you've got the escapement. The escapement is just this kind of 
crazy funky looking wheel and something called the pallet fork and the pallet fork has two tips on it and it will as that as that uh, escape wheel tries to turn it will start and stop it right and what controls the back and forth movement of that pallet fork is what's called the balance the balance wheel the balance spring so it's sort of like a sprinkler head that goes and then it goes back Could, yeah i guess kind of so something that goes back and forth it has something that stops it yeah it's what's really cool about a mechanical, i know that's a really crude it's not a crude a, it's analogy. not a bad analogy but it, what's really amazing about how a mechanical watch works is that you've got this power at one end that's being regulated by something else that it's powering right and the power has to power the balance wheel so that power that 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 torque or that potential torque in that mainspring is powering your balance wheel the balance wheel controls this little pallet fork which doles out the power so it's it's this closed loop system it's really cool and I'm definitely going to include links probably to YouTube and some other things about yeah, how all this works. Yeah, because basically it unwinds it very slowly Yep, and steadily. It allows that mainspring to unwind at a specific rate, which controls your seconds hand and your minute hand and all those gears that power all those, those, um, those hands. So the frequency of a watch is basically how many times that pallet fork beats back and forth in, in in the simplest terms that's what it means and you'll see it listed a couple different ways you'll see it listed in hertz now a hurt one hurt is one complete back and forth movement or no it's one let's see I'm trying to think so a uh, four hertz is one click of that pal so a hurt is one click of the pallet wheel i think is that right no it's one solid back and forth sorry one hurt is when that pallet fork goes click click so forward and back that's a hurt um so if you look at like a, a four hertz watch that's a pretty typical movement speed these days so you've got if it's if it's listed as four hertz it will also be listed as twenty eight thousand eight hundred vibrations per hour so let me explain that when it clicks back and forth once click click that's a hurt right so four hertz is going to give you eight clicks. Does that make sense, PG? Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. so definitely. So four hertz, click, click. If you do that four times, four times two clicks is eight beats. So it's eight beats per second. So if you were to, and I've done this before, it's really cool, use your, your phone and go into slow-mo mode on the camera and you film that, that second hand moving around the dial, you'll actually be able to distinguish eight clicks eight little ticks between yep. and, each index and, mark and you did it you used your your cell phone on yeah, slow it's motion really, it's really fun to do so if you take if it's four hertz multiply that by two that's eight beats per second right click click so that's eight beats per second times 60 seconds times 60 minutes gives you twenty-eight thousand eight hundred beats per hour or vibrations per hour sometimes you'll see it listed that way so Common frequencies are, like I said, four hertz or 28,800 vibrations per hour. Um, three hertz, which is comes out to 21,600 because that's three times two is six. Six times 60 times 60 gives you 21,600 vibrations per hour. Um, the faster a movement beats, theoretically, the more accurate it can be. Um, However, it also wears quicker. So you'll see like you'll see a term called high frequency. And to me, high frequency is anything above four hertz. So the Zenith El Primero movement that's very, very famous movement beats at five hertz, which is thirty six thousand vibrations per hour. Um, several manufacturers out there, Grand Seiko is another one that has a high beat, which is thirty six thousand six hundred or thirty six thousand vibrations per hour. So you're reading reviews, you're listening to podcasts, you're, you know, whatever you're, you're trying to learn about all this stuff. That's all that frequency is. So it can sound, it sounds more complicated than it is, but it's really not. It's just how many, basically how many ticks per hour. That's all it is. So, oh my gosh, I have been talking a ton in this broadcast. <laughs> I think you guys are sick and tired of hearing from me and we are definitely way over our normal time. So 
we got to close this out. Mm -hmm. We already did our shout out. So I think this can be a pretty quick wrap up. Uh, The bottom line is here, guys and gals, you don't need to know all this stuff, right? You're going to learn it over time. The whole point of this is for us to try to help you kind of shorten that learning curve. So as you're reading reviews, as you're listening to podcasts, as you're learning about watches, you're going to know what these terms mean because it took us years to kind of figure all this out, right? And there's a lot of really good podcasts out there. Oh, there's tons really of good podcasts. Good. And there's a lot of good great reading podcasts. Material. There's I'm not a great reader. blogs. I'm not a big reader. RR is a good is a big reader. I read them all. Yep. So that's that was the whole point of this episode. I hope we didn't bore. I hope I didn't just completely bore you to tears. Um, we might call this the technical. Episode. Yeah. Hopefully, we taught you something. I was really excited about this episode, um, just because I'm excited to help people learn about this stuff. And it, like I said, it took us a while. So, if we help to shorten that or make that learning curve a little bit uh, less dramatic, awesome. If we didn't. Let me know that you just got sick of hearing me talk for an hour and 15 minutes and it was a total waste of your time. Uh, that's the kind of feedback we need. So let us know. Uh, PG, anything else to close this out? Oh, no, just just that um, if you learn one thing, like kind of going to a meeting, you sit through a meeting for an hour or two hours. If you learn one thing, it was worth it. So I think even if we got really technical, I think it's really nice that if you can pick something out that you like, that you learn from, I think it's great. Awesome. I, I think that's a, a great way to close the show. And if if there's if you have questions about stuff that we talked about today, you know how to get a hold of us at Perpetual Girl, at Ranch Racer on Instagram. You can go to the website. You can email us. Let us know what you think. Happy to help educate more if I can. I'm still learning a lot of this stuff too. So keep in mind that's this you should always be learning. So with that, let's That's get it. the heck out of here. I'm hungry. Uh, I am starving. It's <laughs> late here and it's time to eat. So guys and gals, thank you so much for joining us for episode seven of Love and Watches. I am Ranch Racer. And I'm Perpetual Girl. And we will catch you guys on the next episode. Later. Later.